Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are tuning in from. Welcome to the fourth episode of our free weekly live webinars, brought to you by the Football Business Academy in partnership with Socrix. My name is Christian Dobrev. I'm the Chief Partnerships Officer at the FBA, and I'll be moderating this webinar. As always, I'd like to begin by thanking everyone who tuned in for last week's thought-provoking episode, in which, together with Dr. Erkut Sogut, Daniel G., Patricia Rodriguez, and Philip Senderos, we looked at what the effects of COVID-19 are on player contracts and the upcoming transfer windows. If you missed it, no worries, just be sure to check it out later as the recording is available on our YouTube channel or indeed on podcasts, Spotify or SoundCloud if you prefer the audio version. For those of you who are new and hadn't heard about the FBA before, we're a Swiss educational institution focused entirely on the football industry. We run a professional master in football business and we also run a number of certificates around the world. Each week of this webinar series, we gather football industry experts who share different perspectives on how COVID-19 is affecting the world of football. Today, we'll discuss what the impact has been on the media and broadcasting, and what's to come in this vastly important landscape, which provides much of the content football fans crave, and by extent, which generates much of the revenue that makes the world of football go round. Our guests today, I must admit, are a bit extra special because all of them teach on the FBA's professional master in football business. So we know them very well and we're very excited that today on this occasion, they'll be able to share some of their insights with everybody. To start, we have Rebecca Smith, better known as Bex, who is the Global Executive Director for the Women's Game at Copa 90. In previous roles, she managed competitions and events at FIFA. And before that, she was a professional football player, having played for clubs across Germany, Sweden, Australia, and has, having represented the New, Nash, the New Zealand national team uh, in two Summer Olympics and one Women's World Cup. Then we also have Misha Sher, who has been at Mediacom Sport and Entertainment for almost eight years, the last three of which as worldwide vice president in which he's been dealing with big brands, sports celebrities, rights holders, and media companies. Next, it's also my pleasure to welcome Anna Chanduvi from the Sports Media Partnership team at Facebook, which combined with her experience at BN Media Group and the NBA, I'm sure she'll have a ton of insights to share on this particular topic. And last but not least, we have our media professor, Marcus Bartos, who's joining us from South America as he was actually going to be venue manager, manager at the Copa Libertadores. Before that, he's developed a long media career at places such as the German FA, the 2006 FIFA World Cup Lo Local Organizing Committee, German broadcaster ARD, and indeed also as UEFA consultant. So there'll be plenty to talk about. And as always, we'll do our best to answer your questions. So do make sure you're logged into your Google or YouTube account so that you can use the chat box and fire away your questions. Then to start today, I'd like to ask a question to, to Bex. And um, the reason why is obviously she's in charge of women's football at Copa 90. And I think we, we can all agree that, that women's football deserves a bit more attention, right? So Bex, uh, first question for you. How has the media responded to women's football in this crisis? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, I actually think it hasn't really responded that much to, to uh, including women's football in the discussions. Um, UEFA made the announcement quite recently that they were going to move the men's Euros back uh, a summer. And in that same announcement, there wasn't uh, really a mention about what happens then to the women's Euros that same summer. Um, obviously, there are other elements that they were waiting for. So they were waiting for the Olympics um, to be rescheduled or not to be rescheduled. Um, so the women's Olympic tournament is quite a big one for on the women's side, whereas it's not as big on the men's. So there were a lot of elements why they were waiting, but still the fact that they didn't make that announcement um, combined with the men's, I think said quite a lot. Um, and I think that there's been quite a lot of interesting articles coming out asking the question, what happens with women's football? Um, but there haven't been a lot that are really sort of leaning into it and answering a lot of those questions and why it's so important right now even more so than ever to really lean in and, and support the women's game. So I think the, the 
response from media has been a bit reflective of actually the fact that women's football has always been sort of um, marginalized or and or developing um, still in a lot of different countries. And, and now we see that, okay, the main topics are still men's football, what happens uh, in the main tournaments for men, what happens in the main leagues for men, but the women's is kind of not discussed really. And it, it's, to be really honest, a, a bit disappointing, I would say. Okay, thanks. We'll, we'll, we'll come back on that later. Misha, what about from, from your perspectives in, in general, obviously looking also at, at the men's game, what, what have been some of the most notable trends that you're, you've seen in the media business uh, in recent weeks? Well, um, it's, been, it's been interesting because you know, there's, there's, there was supposed to be so much live sport and all of a sudden there's none, right? So I think one of the, one of the biggest trends has been to um, was a couple of things. One, obviously, a lot of uh, a lot of archive material because that's all that's all that broadcasters really have. Um, they're relying on a lot of live sport at this particular time. We're talking, you know, all the leagues coming, you know, coming to coming to a close. We have Champions League, year uh, Euros, and so on. So uh, there is this there's this huge uh, there's this huge gaping hole now for content, right? So right, so, so the uh, a lot of the broadcasters and media owners don't really have it. At the same time, you have this migration towards, um, you know, towards YouTube and, and other sort of social digital platforms because that's where you can actually get to some sort of content that's being produced now in what in whatever form. So what you're seeing is, um, you know, people are, you know, at some point there's only so much archive content that you can watch, right? So people are going to, um, you know, they're either going to Facebook or they're going to increasingly going to YouTube because. Uh, you know, the time spent on YouTube, uh, the amount of people that are going there now is, you know, it's got on uh, significantly over the past couple of, over the past three to four weeks. And that's because, you know, people are looking for something that's a bit more current. And, you know, some of the, some of the teams and players who are able to put that, put that content out, that's a bit more, uh, that's a bit more current is what people, is what people are craving. Right. And, and so, Anna, speaking of, of Facebook in particular, what, what have you guys done with regards to the, the sporting competitions that you own the rights to? For example, La Liga in India or the Copa Libertadores. What, what has Facebook done to, to try and you know, accommodate for, for this, this, these changes and, uh, and crisis? Yeah, um, good question. And first of all, thanks for, for having me. Um, good to see everyone, that everyone's doing well. Um, I think it's just a challenging time across the board. You know, us as a sports partnership team at Facebook, we work across a number of different leagues, clubs, athletes, media broadcasters, and each one of those are seeing their business models disrupted. Um, live sport, which ultimately is the pinnacle, um, the pinnacle product and the most important product, the premium product that people pay for, um, that ultimately is the fuel of the football industries that pays for clubs, pays for the salaries of players, um, is flipped on its head virtually. So at the moment for us, our number one priority in, in these challenging times is to really um, support our partners as best as we can. Um, and in some cases that's incredibly challenging. You know, a lot of them um, are having to shift to remote production, something they haven't really done before. Um, bad Wi-Fi signals in different parts of the world, um, working remotely. So we're really just trying to see where we can provide some help. Um, we're seeing a number of different trends across our platforms in, in those times. You know, um, Time spent across social has just been mentioned. We're seeing incredible amount of time spent across Facebook, Instagram, but also Messenger and the messaging apps and services that we own. There's been a plus 50% increase in um, the use of WhatsApp, Messenger, um, but also a lot of the different products that we offer. Um, Facebook Live, for example, is, um, has been up 89% um, in terms of interactions on Instagram, that is plus 150% almost. Um, so we're really shifting the way that content is produced um, across our platforms and how people are engaging with this content. So without straying too far away from your questions, you know, what are we doing? Um, with the with the rights that we've that we've bought in certain markets, you know what we're doing with essentially every every potential partner of ours is just trying to support 
the league, the federation, the athletes, um, provide advice to, to kind of be there and, and make sure that we're doing everything that we can um, to help them in these challenging times. Wow, amazing numbers. Um, and speaking of numbers, Marcus, uh, moving on to you, obviously the disruption um, that we've seen has, has many effects on the industry and, and, and obviously in the next few weeks and months, this will be even clearer, but um, what can the different stakeholders do in your opinion in terms of risk management, right? Uh, and how is it different perhaps between a pay TV channel versus a sports only OTT platform? Yeah, that's a very, that's a very uh, good question, uh, Christian. Risk management usually starts with, with uh, insurance, right? So we've, uh, we've seen over the last few weeks, there's some sports events who, who have done their, let's say, homework or who could afford actually an insurance and to found an insurance partner like, like Wimbledon, for example, or also um, in ice hockey, I think they, they, they're all more or less insured. In foot, football, is not that common. Um, one of the main reasons is because of the big sums and, and rights fees, it's of course a lot more uh, expensive to, uh, to get insurance for, for events and all that. So, so that's one of the main assets, actually, or one of the main topics that uh, federations and 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 um, yeah and leagues have to think about for the future. Because I don't I don't think this this virus will be gone quickly, and and maybe we have a disruptive time ahead of us over the next few years. So so that's one of the things. And and uh, another aspect of risk management is, of course, how do you how do you deal with your partners right now? How do you talk to them? And 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 what's your plan? For the next uh, sales cycle, are you doing a, a tough tender as in the in the past, or are you maybe just um, prolonging partnerships with your with your partners because um, then you can compensate them within maybe another sales cycle? So these are the these are the questions uh, that um, yeah the leagues and federations have to have to ask themselves, and also maybe in the future public broadcasters they are maybe a more safe heaven than. Than the private ones to who, who are hit more and uh, who don't get the support from from government. So those those are all aspects of of risk ma management for the future. So a lot of work ahead of of all the leagues and federations to think about. Absolutely, and and Bex, obviously at, at Copa ninety, um, indirectly that your partners are the fans and the athletes, right? You do so much content with them usually. Um, and now that you cannot physically be with them, how, how has Copa 19 shifted their content strategy at all? Yeah, um, a lot of it is, um, is as some of, the, some of my colleagues have already mentioned, um, some of the highlights and sort of the nostalgic moments of sports. So what are those, what is that content that we've already um, produced that we can, we can show again? What are the partners that we have like the UEFA's or the visas? Um, of the world who have sort of the, the rights um, already incorporated in, in some of the things we've already done with them or how can we borrow from them? Um, and then just really leaning into the different brands. So, um, you know, Budweiser did a really nice uh, campaign, one game. Um, the UEFA and Visa campaign, the train at home was a really nice one. So that it's, it's good to be able to incorporate some of the rights that have already, or the highlights that have already been shown. And again, in the women's game, a lot of those highlights and a lot of those games have actually never been seen for a wide audience. So there's a lot of creative things where you can actually bring that sort of type of content to audiences for the very first time who might've missed it um, when two, three years ago it wasn't on mass TV or those highlights weren't necessarily shown on a platform that didn't exist then. Um, so I think some of the, the content that would be considered old um, is actually quite new in the women's game, which is fairly exciting as well. Um, yeah, so I think that it's about being more creative. Also, I think what player, what people really want to see is, um, I think Marcus or Misha mentioned it already, is the players. So how are we incorporating sort of what players are doing because they're all on lockdown as well. So it's quite a unique time to be able to access and tap into those players who maybe weren't as accessible uh, before. So we just run a, a new campaign with EA, uh, with Rio Ferdinand and, and some current players as well um, on the men's side. So how, how do we tap into them being bored at home as well and show, show what they're doing and actually they're, they become much more like a fan. So you can relate quite a lot with, with the players at this time as well. 
Yeah, definitely. And, and, and Misha, you, you obviously also have worked with a lot of sports celebrities um, and continue to do so. And obviously in recent times with thanks to technology and, and social platforms and whatnot, they have become media figures in their own right. You know, What, what, what are some of your uh, insights or tips that you give uh, athletes right now in terms of you know, how they can stay relevant to their audiences apart from you know, maybe the highlights of their, their past uh, careers? It's this incredible. Uh, uh, sorry, I think it's an incredible opportunity for athletes right now because um, you know I've argued for a long time before before we got into this um, you know into this uh, unfortunate situation that there's never been a better time to be an athlete because people are have always been interested in athletes and you know technology has it has allowed players to completely in many ways bypass the media and be their own and like, as you say be their own media channels and communicate directly with the audience which is what people have always wanted um now they're at home i think what we're you know the advice that we're given the yeah, athletes we're working with is making yourself available uh, people want to hear from you they want and they want to hear about aspects of your life that perhaps you wouldn't have you know you wouldn't necessarily have shared in the past if you think about most athletes the types of things they share, you know, pictures of themselves in training or arriving at a game and so on. They're all pretty, um, they're all pretty standard. There isn't, you know, if you look at most, most players, Instagram or other accounts, they're, you know, they're all the same. Um, they all capture the players and, you know, I practice or like I said, getting out of a car, getting into a car. So right now, um, you know, when you're, when you're at home and you're, you're going through, uh, you know, similar perhaps types of emotions that people can relate to, what it's like to be perhaps away from your, if, if they are maybe away from their families or away from the things that they, that they're used to doing or they enjoy doing, how they keep themselves busy, uh, you know, perhaps co uh, uh, hosting, hosting interactive sessions like, um, you know, whether it's Facebook live or other, other, other ways in which they, in which fans can actually ask them questions and, and, and engage with them. Uh, and the last, you know, the last thing is, you know, we're, what we're saying to them is this is the time for them to really have a look at what does their sort of digital uh, footprint look like? You know, do you have a, you know, do you have a YouTube channel, right? Because if you don't, now is a really good time to start one, right? Establish a YouTube channel, start thinking about the types of content, how you want to come across uh, to your audience, what you want to say, how you want to say it, thinking about the type of content that at the moment it tends to be working for, you know, for others that the, the is not the time and when so that's the types you know those are the types of uh the types of things that we're that we're advising great Th thanks for that misha uh anna back to you um you you mentioned something before already in terms of you know that you're dealing with your different partners right now trying to find obviously alternative content can you can you go a bit deeper into how that works from from you know behind the scenes basically like because obviously all of that content let's say I assume Facebook wouldn't have traditionally had the rights to. So how does that go in terms of distributing in terms of the, the payments? Does that kind of like cover the payments that you were supposed to be seeing uh, for the live broadcast or how, how does that dynamic work? Yeah, um, good question. So 95% um, of the sports content on our platform is unfunded. So um, most of the content that you're consuming and that you're watching um, has been put on the platform in order by publishers in order to drive some kind of business objective, whether that is sponsorship revenue, um, conversions to their OTT platform, um, or, in, or if they want to make incremental um, dollars from, from the revenue of advertising associated to that content. So um, we're still seeing a lot of those forms of monetization still possible across our platform today, obviously with subscriptions being challenged that now a lot of live sport isn't on. So many pay TV channels that were leveraging our platforms to drive that KPI are now um, struggling, of course, in that sense, um, in terms of driving conversions. But what we are seeing, um, and it's been mentioned and touched upon by, by all of you guys here is um, a shift uh, of content, uh, content creation and content production. Um, we're seeing media networks tap into um, TV presenters, um, 
looking and exploring the home workout space. You know, Be In Sport is a great example. They were doing um, home workouts with a lot of the athletes that are self-quarantining. Um, and almost in a way, they are becoming a platform and a voice for their community. Um, and that is what we try to do. You know, Facebook um, ultimately and Instagram as well, they break down the barriers between the fan and the athlete and the club. And it's always around community. And um, for us as a partnerships team, we try to bring all those elements together and help a lot of the different publishers on our platform leverage each other's um, audiences, their ecosystems, their content. Um, one of the other great examples that we've seen is by the zone in Germany that with no live sport, they're looking at their archive and they're being super creative about it. So they got the rights to uh, the Champions League final in 2013, which was Bayern against Dortmund, a very heated game. Um, so they actually re-aired that game as a live with a um, play with a player uh, Ilka Gundogan commentating live over that broadcast and almost giving his behind the scenes perspective. Um, we've seen BT Sport and Sky Sports tap mentioned showing highlight a different perspective, you know, the players um, off the pitch or showing a different camera angle that hasn't been seen before. Um, so we're just seeing a lot of creativity um, among partners. And, and I think what they're realizing is actually there's so many stories that they can tell around the sport that haven't yet really been told. Um, so ultimately it's gonna affect, I think in the long term when we're looking ahead, it's gonna affect the way that people are looking at content consumption, looking at storytelling. You don't always need highlights and live rights in order to be a compelling storyteller as a publisher. Um, so yeah, we're definitely seeing a lot of those trends. Also want to mention is home cooking and home workouts, especially by athletes. We're just seeing that spiking, spiking quite, quite rapidly across our platforms. All right, great. Marcus, um, when we talk about media rights, obviously we have to consider that rights have cycles, right? So usually a broadcaster or any platform will uh, contract for a number of years um, to have those rights in the particular territory. Um, so by default, that also means that, you know, some of these rights holders were potentially in, in the process of tendering for the next cycle, right? And um, in light of this, obviously with the pandemic, you know, broadcasters maybe have different priorities right now. So what would you say is the smartest things thing to do um, for rights holders and broadcasters alike? Is tendering in their interest at all right now? Or could it be potentially more interesting to look at prolonging the current contract and then you know, wait another year or two before of, uh, opening up the new tender? Uh, and again, how, how would this potentially also um, be different between a big league and a small league? All right, that's many questions in one. Um... I'll try to, to uh, yeah, figure it out. Look, um, the Bundesliga, for example, they're right in the middle of a tender. And, uh, and what's happening now is that, of course, they, they have to talk to their biggest partner, which is uh, Sky Germany, now to, to try to find a solution for, for this sub-season, right? Or for, for the rest of, of the season 1920. And um, um, I'm pretty sure that with with the tender kind of stopped and postponed and um, negotiations going on with your biggest partners, I mean that's what most of the leagues and federations should 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 do right now. I mean you have a a great partnership, hopefully with someone who gives you a lot of money, and um, I don't think it's the right time to to change horses at the moment, right? Like you, it's it's probably better to yeah to look at extension of, of partnerships if you have if you had uh, great partnerships over the last few sales cycles and uh, maybe not trying to get the, the last uh, euro or dollar out of um, out of a market I think that should be very very hard right now and then you also have to have to think about maybe you have to compensate your your current partners for for yeah for some things you cannot deliver now maybe you can deliver but no one really knows if 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 the leaks uh, and rights holders can deliver the current uh, uh, contracts so yeah it's 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 a very tough time to to do a tender and and to maybe even think about changing partnerships so 
Yeah, 20, 2021 will be a very interesting year to, to see how it, how it goes because then from a broadcasting uh, partner side, then they see the effects on their revenues, right? Like at the moment, everyone is kind of guessing how, how big is the effect on revenues and all that. But, but next year, they will actually have the effect in their books. And then it might be a very difficult year for, for tendering rights or especially to in hoping to increase your rights fees, right? So, so therefore, yeah, it's, it's should be, you should try to find smart solutions with your partners, maybe right now, extending contracts or agree with them on, on the way a tender could be conducted. That's also one of the things, you know, um, and um, yeah, but um, there's difficult times ahead because all the broadcasters, they're losing an incredible amount of money right now uh, from the from the commercial uh, from the uh, advertising side, so I think the possibility that uh, that the the cycle of increasing rights fee might come to an end uh, over the next 12, 12 months is is pretty high, and there might be even a decrease. So 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 I think the the federations and and uh, rights holders should should keep that in mind already now. Christian, if I, if I can jump in on that, because I thought think that's a really interesting point, because Anna mentioned, you know, being more creative when you don't have live rights um, or highlights uh, to be able to use it. I think it's, it'll be really interesting to see how the media world will shift the different platforms will look um, to diversify uh, those kinds of revenue streams because of the, the so much uncertainty now in the future, even in the next year to two year cycle, potentially four year cycle. Um, how will this be um, sort of a lesson in learning to diversify in not just the live rights, because as, as Marcus mentioned, there's so much money in that, but there's, you know, like a Copa 90, for example, started off of as a, as a platform that never had those live rights. So just looking at the future, how that might, this might be a, a stimulant to actually change the face of some of the, the largest media entities. So it's a very good point, actually, and, and, and um, on the back of that, I wanted to take a question from the audience right now, actually from one of the, the FBA candidates, uh, Domenico Gargano, and this is for you, Beck. So, because you're talking about the creative content and, um, and the lack of life content, right? But knowing that, you know, we're in this until the medical experts and the scientists say that it's safe to go back to normal. Yeah. He's asking, like, how long can these types of you know, content, throwback content or creative content last and, and keep fans entertained? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I guess it's up to the fans too. Um, but some of the interesting things that I've seen is it's not just about uh, video content. I mean, Time Magazine is doing a really interesting um, time for giving. So they're using their platform and their magazine um, to be able to show all the different NGOs and organizations that uh, need to be supported right now. FC Bayern, um, Marcus, you'd appreciate that one, um, have done a really interesting magazine. They launched a magazine and for half of the, the magazine is on women's football. So they had over 30 pages. Um, so not just looking at you know video content, but all the different types of content and media that's out there, I think has been really interesting. Nike as well doing, you know, uh, play inside, play for the world. I think they're, as Misha mentioned, everyone is always interested in sort of the top characters and the, the biggest athletes, what they're doing. And yes, okay, we've seen them competing. You've seen um, the top footballers competing on the pitch, but I think now is the time that actually it's really interesting to get to know these characters off the pitch. And certainly for women's football, that's a massive opportunity because that's one of the places where we had to start. If we're storytellers, you can't tell a story if you don't know who the characters are, right? So actually for women, women's football, there's a massive opportunity now to be able to go behind the scenes and, and actually start to learn who these players are as, as the main characters. Um, so I think there's a lot of different types of opportunities if, if we choose to look at it like that. Um, and I'm really interested to see what kind of content, um, multifaceted types of content will be coming out of, of this time and how that will sort of lay the groundwork for what the future might look like in, in terms of what media is. Great, yeah, definitely. Did that even answer his question, his, her question? I believe so. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> um, Misha, what, what would you say are some of the good examples of how the industry is managing through this? And conversely, if, if you don't mind, would you care to highlight potentially also some, some bad examples um, so that our viewers, 
more than anything can maybe learn you know from those mistakes and if they're working in the industry in that area as well make sure that they don't make those mistakes right so yeah um a good question look i think you know initially i would have i would have, i'd hope that the industry football industry in particular would have stepped up and would have been a bit more uh, um a bit more on the front foot in terms of what you know in terms of what it can do because i always felt that the the power of football um you know to do you know to have purpose and to have you know to uh, to do more uh, to have more of a social impact is 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 quite significant but you know we're seeing that now we're seeing uh, you know we're seeing sponsors who are um utilizing whether it's whether it's the platforms that they have whether it's the facilities they have to actually to do you know to play a role so i think that's been you know that's um that's been that's been great play internationally it could be something that really you know we've seen examples of different associations are doing things just in their own sort of in their own communities but i think the quite the, the most important thing is what can you ask yourself what can you do as a you know as a, as a collective perhaps as players or as a football club or you know, Chelsea providing their, you know, providing the facilities for NHS staff or, um, you know, New Balance re, you know, repurposing the, you know, the facilities that have to make, you know, to make equipment and so on. So we're seeing, you know, we're seeing the industry sort of really step up. But in terms of what's obviously, what's obviously happening is that people are migrating to, um, you know, to streaming, streaming type you know, platforms I mentioned before, particularly around gaming. So, a lot of football fans tend to be, if they're male, they tend to be gamers. So, you know, I really, I, <clears throat> there's been a number of sort of FIFA, I guess, tournaments that have been played in, in, in recent weeks where it could be something that's quite small, maybe over, maybe it's just a, a player playing an influence or someone else. But again, it's about engaging audiences and raising, you know, sort of raising money for, um, you know, for uh, a health service or something else. Recently, in the last couple of days, we've seen the tournament that, that the FA, uh, the FA of sanctions, I suppose, where you have, where you have, I think, like 20 English internationals, some of them female, and backs, I think. So also playing, you know, playing in the sort of knockout, um, knockout FIFA tournament where all the money that's being, you know, all the money that's being donated is going to, um, is going to National Health Trust. So uh, this idea of, you know, sort of here we are, what can we do where, you know, where everyone's stuck at home, players like to game, if they're, you know, if they're going to game, they might as well play, you know, they might as well create something that engages people that has, you know, that has another dimension to it, which is where, you know, which is not just playing, but actually, you know, raising money. And I think if there's a, <clears throat> to add to that, if you can bring, and I think there are some examples of this where you can bring other types of personalities outside of sport, make it more pop culture, make it more sort of entertainment where you can bring a comedian or a movie star or someone else this sort of cross-pollination of, of football uh of football and culture coming together again in this sort of new as Beck said it's kind of this new uh, new world where we're you know we have to find a way to uh to connect to engage to constantly evolve what we think entertainment is right because you know, there are only so many uh, home workouts that people, you know, that people can do. And I think that gets quite old very quickly. There's so many sort of FIFA tournaments that people, that you can do. So you have to sort of think about how do you build on that? How do you, how do you uh, grow an audience? How do you build some sort of engagement? And, and again, for me, uh, you know, a big element of that is opening it up to people, right? Trying to get people, uh, you know, any way that you can get people to engage, to participate, to ask, questions to actually you know to get the interaction with the stars that um you know that they perhaps never get to see or uh, never get to see in that you know in that in that environment is a great way is a, is a great you know is a great time to do it you, know, you asked about bad examples i can't think of um you know i can't think of any bad i might do i'll think of some bad ones but uh there are certainly some some clever examples of players making themselves available uh for either interactions or again coming together as a collective for a FIFA tournament like we've seen recently is that you know is a is a great example of how they're tapping into the way people are moving to streaming they're tapping into their uh, you know into the habits around gaming 
and also use that as a way to you know to raise money for um, you know for great causes. Thanks, um, Anna. M Misha mentioned a lot about you know engagement and growing the audience and things like that. Um, to take a question from the audience again, we have Charlie Hayworth asking specifically to you. Yeah, so he's saying that TikTok has over five hundred million MAU and has had a fifteen point four up, a percent uprise in traffic since COVID-19. And he's asking, is it a platform that clubs, leaks, and broadcasters should be looking at more? Uh, is it something Facebook are monitoring? Yeah, good question. Thanks for that question. I was expecting a TikTok question. Um, yeah, I think, look, at the end of the day, it's worth seeing time spent across all social streaming platforms increase dramatically apps like house parties, Zoom. I think I read a crazy stat the other day that Zoom is now worth more than all American airlines combined. So um, it's not a surprise. I think as a content creator, um, ultimately you need to be where your audience is. Um, you need to be very deliberate around what your goals are. You know, is it um, monetization? Is it brand awareness? Is it the driving sales what is your ultimate goal um, as a publisher and how are you going to use the different platforms available to you in order to drive those goals through the content you have access to and at your disposal so um, I think as a club and as a league definitely having a presence in TikTok um, is a smart idea the same way that you would have an Instagram channel a Facebook page YouTube channel so um, just really looking at um, squeezing as much out of your content as you can is I think is a smart thing to do in in today's day and age especially as people are consuming more and more content so um, yeah I think quite a simple answer would be yes um, it's important to look at every possible app um, that's out there in order to reach your audience great thanks for answering that uh, Marcus back to you um, a lot of attention right now goes for logical reasons towards, you know, whether we're going to complete the current seasons or not, um, especially at domestic level, of course. But then looking ahead, you know, this disruption is causing major shifts in the schedule for next season already, um, with major tournaments such as the Euros, Copa America, uh, the Olympics, of course, you know, shifting to 2021. Once it's all scheduled accordingly, what do you think will be the biggest challenge for the stakeholders? Once there's all the tournaments, you know, set. What do you think is going to be the the most difficult thing to deal with from a, from a, from the different point of view? You know, whether it's the broadcasters, the competition organizers, the fans, the brands. Yeah, there is. I would even go further uh, and look uh, into the season twenty two or into the sports calendar twenty two because <laughs> that's when when another big tournaments uh, and. Uh, uh, I'll go ahead. So, like, you have you have a shift not only uh, not only from 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 this year to next year, but also from next year to the year after, uh, and the season. And then this is the, the 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 Qatar World Cup year. So, yeah, like we will have this these discussions over the next two to three years, actually. Um, well, there <clears throat> the challenges. Well, for if there's a really dense sports calendar, let's say next year. The challenge for the organizers and for for right souls, of course, is is to get uh, awareness. Right? Uh, what 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 the colleague said before. Um, uh, and you know, you have a lot more competition at the same time uh, with other sports events. Uh, like in 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 22, there could be uh, uh, athletics, world championships, Commonwealth Games, and European Championships in Munich within four weeks, as it looks like at the moment. So it's like three uh, athletics events at the same time. Well, this is crazy. So, so who gets the attention there? Um, from a, from a, from a broadcaster uh, point of view, it's also uh, it's also difficult to to program all this this stuff. Like let's say you have uh, you're a big broadcaster and have several rights. And uh, you were used to you kind of you know showing live sports highlights during a week on Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and there was like the big events where where you got great audiences, right, for live sports. Now you you might have uh, next year Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night. You have live sports all the time. So 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 the live programming could become a bit you know 
it doesn't matter if I look today, maybe I, I can still look something tomorrow or the day after. So, so that's the big challenge for broadcasters, how to, same, same again, like how to get the awareness onto their channels and, and um, yeah, they're, then they probably have to, to work a lot in all those social media uh, platforms and so on to, to really get a focus to their, to their customers and clients. So yeah, the next two two years of the sports calendar will be will be really crazy, and um, yeah, maybe maybe some some events get get really, especially the smaller ones, they will just maybe get even left behind, you know, on the on the let's say on the live programming side, maybe they have to to change their focus into into highlights and into into their, their social media channels. Because there's so much live sport maybe available that I don't know a swimming European Championship or whatever it is might not you know take place on 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 big channels anymore. So yeah, everyone, all the all the stakeholders have have big challenges uh, ahead of them just to get the awareness they they are used to be getting when when they they had a standalone event, right? For sure. And just to quickly follow up on that, Marcus, we have Sofia Arango asking on our chat, um, what, what is Copa Libertadores doing right now to make the best of the situation and, and trying to have a bigger presence in the world? Yeah, well, there, there's not much they, they can actually do right now. Um, they, they, they're in a very close relationship with, with UEFA. So, so what they're doing with, with Copa Libertadores and uh, Copa America also, who, who was supposed to be take place this summer, they've postponed everything, uh, the big events to, to next year in parallel to, to UEFA, also with regards to, to player releases on the, and all that. So they're, they're pretty, pretty tight there. Um, with regards to, I don't know, activities on their, on their platforms and social media activities, I'm not really up to date right now, but I guess like everyone else, they're trying to get archive material up, up and running and do some interesting player stories and, uh, you know, just to keep, keep yourself up there uh, in, in, in the time of, of no live football. But, but especially in South America, the, the situation for the clubs and the federation will be even worse than, than in Europe or, or the United States because, you know, they, they're working from a, from a lower in, income level and so of course in, in in on a continent like south america the the crisis will probably hit even harder like uh, clubs going bankrupt and all that you probably see see a lot more here uh than in europe or or the united states so that's 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 the problem they're actually looking at they're they're, they're really scared of losing stakeholders after two or three months you know for sure and Bex, to, to relate that to, to the women's game, obviously, I mean, we, we've seen fo women's football having gained um, enormous momentum over the past couple of years, which, which has been awesome. Uh, but then still, you know, you, now, you and I both know that in, in, in some clubs still, women's football is seen as a cost rather than you know, a, a profit-making business. Do you think, is, is there a way to keep that momentum going and, and, and prevent from that investment into the women's game, which is so hardly needed, to, to, to go to a decreasing um, mode? Um, like, what are the, the risks that women's football is yeah. taking now on, on behalf of uh, COVID-19? Yeah, it's a really good point. Marcus made a, a good point, too, about the cram schedules, um, where women's football was already quite vulnerable and already trying to sort of make elbow room for itself. Um, what we saw in 2019, so last year, was because it was a standalone event and because there were no other events that, that really um, took away from the spotlight being on, on women's football during the summer. Uh, I mean, oh, yeah, you had Copa America and things um, coming in the end, but um, that was what sort of allowed it to stand alone and get so much visibility, which is so important, I think, now for the women's game, which is kind of why I'm in media at all. Um, I think it's sort of the, the biggest area um, that needs that needs growth right now to be able to drive the game forward. And if we look and see, you know, women's Euros, which was in 2021, which will now be sharing the same year as Marcus mentioned, the, the Men's World Cup in Qatar, even though they're different um, months and they don't compete with the dates, they're still, if you're a broadcaster and you have, you know, X amount for that cycle or that year, you're gonna now be splitting it or if you're a sponsor. So looking at the different budgets, I think um, it's really important that the women's game it is part of football. So whatever that entity is, whether it's the FA or UEFA or a club, 
um, that it can't be seen as a, as a default and a secondary um, sort of topic to be thinking about. It has to be integrated into the overall strategy of, of that club, of that governing body. Um, and so far, I haven't seen really that many doing it well. Um, you see clubs talking about, you know, putting staff on furlough or not on furlough, but they don't even mention their women's club, which may or may not even be in their top league the, net, the following season. Um, so I, I think that the women's game football has to be looking at um, the women's game as part of as part of the the full entity. And until it starts doing that, it's it's going to struggle. And and we're going to see a lot of clubs, I think, go bankrupt, as Marcus was mentioning, um, all around the world. And I, I think this is it's so important now that the media platforms, that the broadcasters, that the clubs, that all of those entities that can um, need to be looking at uh, the women's game as part of the integration of the entire um, ecosystem of how they look at things. Otherwise, uh, we're going to see women, the women's game go back really quickly, um, which would be super sad given the amazing summer we had last year. Yeah. M Misha, what, what, what do you make of all of this? Because obviously, there's a saying that, you know, you should never let a crisis go to waste. So how would you apply this to the current situation? Yeah, uh, great question. I mean, look, you know, I, I, I said in the beginning when, when all this happened, it's all a bit, um, it could be a bit overwhelming. And because we don't know how long this is going to carry on for, you know, you, can, you can't help, you can at times feel a bit helpless because you know, we don't know if we're in lockdown for, you know, for a month, for two months, for three months, how long, how long our industry is going to be at standstill. We don't know, right? So that's, you know, that's a, if you park that, you say, okay, well, what, what can we control, right? What do we, as, you know, individuals, as companies, uh, what, what can we, can we use this opportunity to make sure that when we come out the other side, all those other clubs will struggle, should we emerge? And I think, you know, we keep going back to, to this idea of how, um, you know, how we interact with one another. I think what this, what this crisis has highlighted is, 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 the, is to have an ecosystem and have, have a, uh, have a system in place that allows both the players in this particular case and the and the, and the, and the, and the teams um, to be properly set up to be able to engage with their fans' experience. But if you look at um, you know if you look at uh, a lot of the sports teams around the world, if you think of how they're set up on the on this on the digital front, what you know what are the types of channels you know do they have uh, do they have a YouTube channel? Do they have, you know, do they have TikTok? What is the types of content that they create? Um, how good is that content and things like that? I think they probably wouldn't have, wouldn't have been necessarily paying attention to a lot of that, uh, you know, before the crisis. Whereas now coming out of this or at this particular time, all of them should be, should be, should be having a good look at where they are and how, how, how over reliant perhaps they are on major sort of live broadcasting rights and on their you know on their gate receipts so on sponsorship and everything and kind of seeing social and other things like that and content is more of a of a nice to have but I think going forward it's going to be critical to the way they operate uh, and a big that they're able to drive revenue going forward so you know just as an opportunity to really build themselves up to start creating you know, creating a um developing themselves as media uh, as sort of as media businesses and the same goes same goes for football clubs how will they when all of this is over how will they keep connected with their fans and how will they build new uh, can they develop new business models the answer is yes um going forward that allow them to, to deliver what what fans want increasingly and, and be able to dry, uh, drive revenue through sponsorship and subscriptions and otherwise um, through, you know, through, through what they, through what they do. Um, the worst thing they can do is sit back and do nothing and come out of this and operate in exactly the same way they did before because I think they'll find themselves in a, in a pretty, pretty significant disadvantage. Thanks. Anna, we, we have a question from uh, Jason Rubenstein. Um, and he's asking, how do you see, how do, how do you foresee football clubs adjusting to fanless games? Um, because obviously, I mean, in short term, once we do get the green light that 
uh, games can be held. The likelihood is that this will be in, uh, in empty crowds, basically. Uh, but then from a media point of view, of course, you know, we always say that watching uh, a football game on TV where there's no crowd is, is not as appealing as, you know, hearing the fans, basically. So how do you see that both short term and long term, also considering that maybe, you know, the psychological effects of this whole pandemic being that a lot of people won't be OK anymore with, with going to big crowd events? Yeah, that's a good question. It's also one that we that we discuss a lot, you know, as a team. Um, at the end of it, nothing can beat um, people being in a stadium. You know, that is what sport is about: um, community, people coming together, venues full, um, people cheering. Um, and no doubt, when the time comes and when that is okay again, we're going to see venues at capacity. But I think in a world where social distancing remains the norm. Um, we are, you know, as, as Marcus, Misha and Rebecca all mentioned, um, Rebecca, <laughs> I've never called you Bex, as Bex, <laughs> as, as they all mentioned, is that, you know, business models are inevitably going to have to change. Um, revenue streams are going to have to be diversified. Content production, storytelling is going to have to shift. Um, there's going to be, I predict there's going to be less dependence on live, uh, probably more dependence on leveraging your athletes and deeper storytelling around players that might not always be in the limelight. You know, there's so many different angles that a club can take in creating content because at the heart of it, you know, sport and football is entertainment. It's to entertain their fans. It's to entertain their audience. And um, I truly believe that publishers, especially clubs, can continue to do that in a world where social distancing remains. And for us, you know, we will continue to empower them, support them, to give them creative ideas and, and consulting. Um, but one for me that probably is the biggest question mark is to see how revenue streams change, you know, how is sponsorship going to be affected by this? Uh, clubs make a lot of the top clubs at least make a lot of their revenues from um, gate fees um, match day purchases so how are they going to offset that loss you know as social distancing remains the norm so um, I think another one to mention um, is broadcasters you know pay tv broadcasters how are they going to shift to um, to overcome this how are they going to survive this challenging time especially the ones that are really just licensing content and renting rights and taking one piece of content that's created by one entity showing it on their platform and putting a paywall behind it you know once that content is no longer available how are they going to continue monetizing so i think there's going to be a lot of shift um, Arguably, this is probably accelerating some of the trends we are seeing in sports. You know, Marcus talked about the rights bubble or the sport bubble potentially bursting or shifting. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, the, the silver lining at least is what, what, what I'm looking at. And we're going to see, I think, a lot more creative storytelling, diversification, more, a more democratic sports industry is at least what I'm hoping to see um, coming out of this pandemic. Yeah. And uh, I'm just going to also add in another question because it's been asked a couple of times on our chat. Do you see this as potentially the, the definitive boost that esports could uh, take advantage of to kind of like, you know, really take uh, presence in every household around the world and, and mm -hmm. offset, you know, the, the viewing ship from live sports to, to esports? You know, that's an interesting question. Like, I'm seeing so much esports coming to life. Um, broadcasters streaming e-games to a lot of federations running their own esports competitions like Formula One, FIFA. Um, the underlying question to me really is, um, do, does the average sports fan consume esports? Um, and, and who really is the audience of esports? I know me personally, I don't. Maybe there's people that do. Um, Again, it's a form of entertainment that is satisfying people now that there's no live sport. So maybe we will see a spike in demand and consumption, but ultimately um, it will be, I don't know. My personal opinion is that it will not be a true substitute for live sports, especially if you ask the average sports fan, if they watch esports. my prediction would be most of them are no. And the true e-sport fans probably watch things like League of Legends, Call of Duty. Again, I'm not an esports pro, so I might be 
mentioning the wrong leagues here, but um, I think that is the underlying question is, again, for how long will, will that be able to satisfy um, the lack of live sports? We will see. Thank you. Marcus, um, another one for you here um, from Jordi Mestre. Do you reckon uh, we will witness a generalized decrease in the price of broadcasting rights that might lead even to a decrease in player salaries and transfer prices? And he's asking how long could this trend last? Do you have like any estimates in terms of how much the market for, for media rights could, could be disrupted by and in effect, you know, the rest of the, the industry? Well, I'd like to, I'd also like to know the question. It's really uh, the answer actually, that's, that's, that's a, uh, yeah, that's a good one. Well, I guess I, I said before, there could be, uh, uh, there could be, uh, in a decrease there could be maybe we have reached a peak right now but the, but the prices always depend on competition right so and this will still be the same in the future like if you have a, a good life right and uh, let's say two broadcasters have survived the crisis then there will be competition for your rights and you might be able to to achieve a, a good a good price uh, a bit, maybe even a better price than before in general, well, the assumption would be that, uh, yeah, maybe maybe the big spiral up might be coming to an end uh, right now, or maybe we see really moderate uh, increases or just uh, federations prolonging partnerships, extending them maybe with the same price and, and so on. I mean, for me, the most important question is in, 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 in this regard now is how do the football stakeholders Actually, how do they how do they behave? How do they act uh, uh, with each other? I mean, everything they do. Like, if you are a, a, a partner of of a league right now and you stop your payment, okay, you jeopardize your own product, right? I mean, if if things go really bad, then then your product disappears and you have nothing. Well, you maybe have saved one one installment, but uh, the product is gone also. So I think that's the the most decisive question now is not you know do i get five percent more or or less or whatever it's like how how do we all you know work together and everyone has has to work together like the the broadcaster the federation and and even the fans and uh, and so on to to actually make make products survive like the live products and and to to give them a chance for the future so i think for at least the next right cycle for for most of the contracts and there's a lot of contracts running out actually this year and and next year and everyone will be on the market more or less at the same time and uh, lots of broadcasters in crisis and and so on so well my my prediction is that for the next right cycle there will will, will come to a to a, to a, to an end may at least for well let's say the majority of rights and uh, yeah but uh, but it's really hard to tell because each product is is different and as I mentioned before, if you have two competing for a right, then the prices can still go up. If if both need it desperately, then you you can still be lucky. Right. Then um, Bex, last question for you uh, from from the audience here. We have Ella Joannes asking because I mean. We, we spoke a lot about the potential risks and, and, uh, and detriments towards women's football, but she's actually asking a very interesting question. She's asking, what kind of opportunities are there going to be for women's football after this crisis? Yeah, that's a great question. That's kind of like, right when, when this all started, that's where my head went because there's certainly gonna be more opportunities um, or you have to see it see it that way. Otherwise, um, it's just going to sink, right? Um, but I definitely think it, it kind of relates actually to the last topic that both Anna and Marcus were, were mentioning. It's the, I think that what, what now we're seeing is the acceleration of the disruption of the, the market in the media rights. And also um, with Copa 90, we've seen from our modern fan report, just the consumption of fans. So how are they consuming football? Um, which then leads back into the first question that I got, well, you know, how creative or how long are we going to be interested in these kinds of, of stories? I think that, that actually it's all about where the audience sits. So what we've seen is actually the cons how where fans consume football is not just live, right? It's not just watching, you know, um, a broadcast TV of, of a live game. It's actually in 
in um, dark chat rooms where they're chatting with each other. It's on Twitter, or it's on all these different platforms or on Facebook, who also has now live rights, which is, you know, not wasn't necessarily a, a traditional um, broadcaster. So I think actually that market is just shifting to where that audience is. And I think the younger audience is much more on social and digital platforms. Um, it's just what we're seeing. And, and our Modern Fan Report uh, certainly had the data behind that as well. Um, and I, I think that's a real opportunity in the women's game because I think most of where people consume women's football and, and women's sports in general, actually, and follow, can be able to follow these incredible athletes is on their own social platforms. I think Misha mentioned it. You know, what are those opportunities that they're now taking to their players? Um, I think there's a massive opportunity for players to become more well known through this crisis in these couple months um, that they can use their platforms to really grow their own brands. Um, and I think that where traditional you know, media broadcasters have not really given that visibility, those social platforms are now um, going to be more, more and more uh, important and essential for, for fans to be able to follow football in general. So fans will be more likely to be engaging and consuming football on those platforms. And that's where most of the women's game already lives. Um, so I think it's, it's just like I think Anna mentioned, it's accelerating sort of that shift uh, away from live traditional, let's just sit on a couch and all drink a beer and watch a live game to actually let's do it through all of the different chat rooms and, and social media platforms. So that, that's certainly one, um, one area that I think the women's game will benefit from is, is actually the consumption habits of fans. All right, Let, let's hope for the best. Um, <laughs> then guys, to, to wrap this up, I wanted to ask one question, the same question to all four of you and you have about a minute each to, to give your uh, thoughts and opinions on that. Um, the question is, how will the current crisis shape the media industry um, within the football industry, of course, in the long term? Misha, you want to go first? Sorry, the question is, how will the current crisis shape the media industry? Yeah. Hey, look, I think, you know, not to, not to repeat what everyone's always uh, what everyone's always said but i think what's going to happen is the 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 uh, the shift to you know the shift away uh you know from live rides i mean live is still going to be important but i think the this this in another sort of industry in itself this sort of not ecosystem of uh of content that can be created around around uh talents and stories and, and things that we don't get to see sort of day to day um, it's going to become it's going to become the norm. I think we've been talking about sort of content and content over the last couple of years, and obviously we think we've seen publishers like Copenhagen have done so have done really well, recognizing that that was happening is sort of at the beginning, and it really sort of and, and it really led the way. And I think now this is you know that's going to be the new you know it's going to be the norm. People are uh, you know in this in this time are consuming con that type of content. They like it um they want to see more of it um they'll be you know it's going to become the type of thing that they will expect so i think you know the um, you know what, what's going to happen is i think we're going to move uh, we're going to move away from this environment where majority of the interaction and consumption is happening via you know official bro major broadcasters and it's going to go and it's going to happen a lot more in the, you know in the digital environment um via players own sub channels via clubs channels on uh, you know, on, uh, on digital platforms as much as, as they will in, you know, uh, or more, more so, so than, than they have perhaps in the past. All right, thanks. Anna, seems to be a good time to be at Facebook. Do you agree? Um, yeah, I think in general, like, it's, I think it's for me personally, I'm not saying this because I work there. It's, I just love working at Facebook and my job, I get to work across um, a number of different sports um, organizations. But I think if I was predicting the long term effect um, in terms of monetization, we're going to see diversification in revenue streams. Content production is going to get more creative away from live. Misha mentioned content consumption as well as going to shift. I think now people are used to tuning in um, people. We already saw a spike in, in consumption across social media, but I think coming out of this pandemic, social media is gonna be an important channel for a lot of um, sport publishers. And in terms of them engaging their, their audiences, whether that's 
putting up behind the scenes content to drive people to watch the full live version of a game. But we're gonna see social media becoming an increasingly important mix of the content um, output of, of publishers. Um, and I think ultimately the storytelling um, at the heart of all this is gonna shift. You know, We're gonna see players have a different voice, um, people and networks tapping more into potentially reporters that they have and telling the stories around, you know, creating um, a piece of a piece of content for, for uh, ahead of a game. So we're going to see a lot of, um, I think, shifts across each individual segment um, segment of, uh, of football. Thank you. Marcus, what about you? Uh, thinking about post 2022, obviously, to, to not overlap with some of your previous thoughts. Where do you think it's going to be three, four, five years down the road? Yeah, we, we might see um, less competition for, for broadcast rights. Maybe we don't see some companies back again. But then on the other hand, I, uh, I would like to mention, like everyone um, in this group was saying, uh, yeah, it might be going away from live to, to all those social platforms, right? I, I asked the question, how great would it be to see a live football match right now? No, I, so I, I, you can also see it from the other side. So, I mean, there's, there hasn't been any live matches for so long. So there's so many people thirsty for a good, football life match uh, out there so uh, yeah so yeah we'll see the the landscape will change for sure uh, in 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 different ways and uh, we say different we, we will see different players uh, different competition different prices and uh, yeah so it's hard to to see the the future in 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 total but one thing's for sure: the football media landscape will will change dramatically. I think, and we might not see some clubs back again, and and so on. So maybe even some competitions. Uh, yeah, we'll see. All right, great. And last but not least, Bex, 2023 Women's World Cup. What's the media <laughs> landscape going to be? At the uh, biggest and best ever in Australia and New Zealand, obviously. <laughs> um, no, I think uh, Anna mentioned increase of creativity. I think in times like this, this is exactly when uh, you get that bubble of creativity. You have to you have to think outside the box. You have to do things differently. So that's going to be really exciting. It's already exciting to see some of the cool stuff that's coming out. Um, I think that brands are going to get much more involved and be at the center of, of content. So we talked a lot about media and broadcast and all the different platforms, but I think brands actually are the ones kind of have, which who have been driving um, a lot of the discussions and a lot of the topics now. Um, and then thirdly, I would say that I think players are going to become a lot more at the heart of the content. Um, it's sort of where I started and where I think it should be going anyway. Um, it's where the stories start and, and should really end. But I also think that throughout this whole process, it's been really interesting to see that, I mean, we're social creatures as humans, right? And that's exactly what we're missing is in all this isolation. And what we realize so much is how heavily we depend on the media now in these times and brands to be able to create that community. And I, and I hope that, that that leaves a long lasting legacy for, for media and for content creators, um, like brands, like clubs, like platforms, like Facebook, like Copa 90s. Um, that we can really sort of be driving those communities in, in the right way to try, to try to sort of help people through these times. I think um, the importance of that shouldn't be sort of forgotten. Um, and I hope that that leaves a legacy that we, we can continue. Let's hope. Great. And with that, it's time to wrap up this uh, very interesting episode four of our webinar series. Uh, thank you for everybody who tuned in. Thank you to Rebecca Smith, Misha Sher, Anna Chanduvi, and Marcus, Marcus Bartosz specifically for sharing so many of your insights and perspectives on this topic. Uh, for anyone that joined us later or wants to share this webinar with, uh, with some friends or colleagues, uh, it will be available on our YouTube channel shortly. Or if you prefer the audio version, don't, don't forget, you can always uh, head over to podcast, Spotify, or SoundCloud uh, as of Thursday to, to listen into the same uh, webinar. Thank you, everybody, and stay safe. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye-bye.